one of the out rooms there. Yeah, we'll put you in the dining room. Yeah, well, yeah. We're more elegant than yes. that. So we have a nice seat there. Yeah. 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 Yeah
This gives us hope. We anticipate again the birth of the baby Jesus, remembering that Jesus helps us know God's love for us. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the day, you are the pot, we are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Think about a potter. Potter takes clay and forms it in a way that is pleasing. That is what God is able to do with each person. We are reminded that we are all the work of God's hands. How do we use the gifts that God has formed in us? Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for your son Jesus. Thank you for the words of the prophet Isaiah that remind us that you are the source of our hope. Help us to live each day allowing you to form us in a way that brings about your kingdom here on earth. Amen. About this, your talk. Mm -hmm. Okay. About this time, Caesar Augustus, the Roman Emperor, decreed that a census should be taken throughout the nation. This census was taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Everyone was required to return to his ancestral home for this registration. And because Joseph was a member of the royal line, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, King David's ancient home journeying there from the Galilean village of Nazareth. He took with him Mary, his fiancée, who had obvious, was obviously pregnant by this time. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born, and she gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him in a blanket and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the village inn. That night, some shepherds were in the field outside the village, guarding their, sheep, their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel appeared among them, and the landscape shone bright with the glory of the Lord. They were badly frightened, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you the most joyful noise ever announced, and it is for everyone. 
the Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born tonight in Bethlehem. How will you recognize him? You will find a baby wrapped in a blanket, lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by the, the vast host of others, the armies of heaven praising God. Glory to God in the highest heaven, they sang, and peace on earth for all those pleasing him. When the great army of angels had returned again to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Come on, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this wonderful thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They ran to the village and found their way to Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in a manger. The shepherds told everyone what had happened and that the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story expressed astonishment. Mary quietly treasured these things in her heart and often thought about them. Then the shepherds went back again to their fields and flocks, praising God for the visit of the angels and because they had seen the child just as the angel had told them.
Jesus, bring your addictions. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. There is power.
Romans 10.4 says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Romans 8.1 Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Matthew 5, 17 through 20. And Revelation 19, 16 says, And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords.
Uh, I have a big prayer this morning for uh, Dale Jenkins. Uh, she planned to come to church this morning, but woke up with spots all over her. <laughs> uh, and uh, they weren't, uh, except on her face, I guess they were everywhere else. <laughs> Feels she is being uh, kind of like, uh, tested like Job, but uh, uh, she's not giving up. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to know if there's any more prayers this morning. I'd like to open it up to, uh, to people who may have a praise or a prayer this morning. Mm-hmm. He um, process that they sent him through for his cancer did not work. Huh. So he'll be taking chemo the rest of his life. Yes. Wow. Well, that's a big prayer. Uh, let's let's just bow our heads right now. Oh. Oh. Okay. Traveling of mercies. Okay. Yes. Uh, Let's bow in prayer this morning. Dear Lord, we thank you for each and every soul that's here, Lord. We uh, give thanks for all that you've done for us, Lord. We thank you for your great mercies and kindness. Lord, uh, you are our Savior. You are our guide in everything we do. We pray for those this morning that are on the prayers list, Lord, and those that we we don't know, Lord, that you would uh, give them a physical touch this morning, Lord. Be with uh, those who have doctors and those who are at the end of their life, Lord, that you would just be with them, Father. And we want to pray for our uh, emergency services, our fire departments, our police, who are out there every day trying to... uh, Serve us, Lord, and protect us, Lord. We ask your blessing upon them and our service members also, Lord. We uh, just give you thanks again for all that you provide. And we thank you for these people. And uh, we just ask your blessing on our, on our congressmen, Lord, and our people who serve, our president, Lord. We just pray that you would be with them, Lord, and that you would guide them in the way that they should go. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, could the children come up now for uh, offering? I hope there's some. Yeah, we got some there. Okay, let us let's pray. Okay, let's give a prayer to for the offering this morning. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we are so blessed by you, and we just pray that you uh, you would take this offering to advance your kingdom, Lord. And uh, Lord, we just want to give back part of that which you have given to us, Lord. That is your. that belongs to you anyway. And we just give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.
How special, how special it is this morning that we come to the Lord's table. I would ask that if you would, that you put away all thoughts, all worldly thoughts. Keep in mind that Jesus Christ manifested himself to us, coming to earth, living, bred, died, resurrected, and ascended to heaven that we may have an everlasting home when we leave this earth. As we prepare for communion, we ask you to bow your heads, we'll pass the communion plates, and we'll take communion together for the bread and the cup. Let's go. At Jesus Christ's Last Supper, he took the bread, he broke it, and he gave thanks. Heavenly Father, we're indeed thankful for the blessings that you bestow upon us. And Lord, we're indeed thankful for the sacrifice that you made. Help us to take this bread, reflecting your body that was taken, abused for us, that we may have everlasting life. He took that, gave it to his disciples, and they ate 
do this in remembrance of me. Following the meal, he took the cup, fruit of the vine, he poured that, gave thanks. Heavenly Father, we're indeed thankful for the fruit of the vine. The cup to us as Christians is the blood sacrificed on our behalf to form a new covenant with us that we may have everlasting life with our belief in you. He gave this to his disciples, says drink, do this in remembrance of me. As we leave this table, let us remember to love one another the same as God loves us. Amen. Good morning. You know, America is rapidly becoming a diverse, spiritually diverse culture. When I was growing up, you were either Protestant or Catholic, but just about everybody believed in Jesus. Today, millions are rejecting traditional Christianity. Some are experimenting with Eastern religions with its mysticism and meditations, and others are turning to New Age religions with their belief in reincarnation and channeling. College students are enamored with liberal thought and abandon entire portions of the Bible in favor of humanistic thought. And one of the fastest growing religions in America are the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, those with no religious belief at all. So the Christian faith is being challenged today on every hand. Believers in Jesus Christ need to develop a solid basis for their faith. If you don't have that, you're going to get tossed around by every wind of doctrine and you'll probably be embarrassed someday when, with, by your inability to defend what you believe. 1 Peter 3.15 says, You must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. Christians who were able to take the pressure of Nazi Germany in the late 1930s tell us that those who withstood the pressure were those who had an intellectual basis for their faith and not just an emotional t attachment to their church. We need to have more than just warm, fuzzy feelings about First Christian Church and our faith in Jesus Christ. I want us to be able to give a reason for the hope that we have in Jesus. Emotions fluctuate, churches rise and fall, but only Jesus Christ will endure forever. That's why the Bible says no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, which is Jesus Christ. So for the next several weeks leading up to Christmas, we're going to focus on why Jesus came. And in this series, we're going to look at different statements that Jesus himself made in, w in which he articulated the purpose for his coming to earth. And when the series is over, I hope we have a better understanding of who Jesus is and his mission, as well as our own mission. So we're going to be begin this morning in Matthew 5, 17, just one verse this morning. Jesus says, don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you this morning and we praise you this morning for who you are. And Lord, we want to find out more of why Jesus came to this earth. Why would he leave the glory of heaven, the glory of your side, to come to a sinful world and take on the, the abuse, the misunderstandings, the confusion, and the hatred of the people to, towards him? Lord, give us a better understanding. Open our eyes and our ears that we might understand better why Jesus came to this earth. Lord, at the end of the day, we'll give you all praise and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Now, I want to warn you, this is not going to be an entertaining sermon that has direct application to your marriage or deals with some relevant controversial issue. But if you'll pay attention and think with me this morning, I think it will benefit you by giving you a solid foundation that you can build your faith on. A preacher was accused of preaching over the heads of his congregation, and he said, well, they're just going to have to lift up their heads. And I want you to lift up your heads today and think about three different ways that Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament law. First, Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament predictions. He said, I did not come to abolish the law of the prophets. I came to fulfill them. Ecclesiastes 8 verse 7 says, Indeed, how can people avoid what they don't know is going to happen? No human being can accurately and consistently predict what's going to happen tomorrow. The weatherman, with all of his sophisticated equipment, cannot give an accurate five-day forecast. The best Las Vegas odds makers frequently miss the outcome of sporting events. But God has the capacity to predict exactly what's going to happen in the future. Isaiah 46 verse 9 says, Remember the things I have done in the past. For I alone am God. I am God and there is none like me. Only I can tell you the future before it even happens. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. The Old Testament law and prophets made over 200 predictions about the coming of the Messiah. And with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls back in the 1940s, it's been determined and proven that those Old Testament scrolls were written hundreds of years before Jesus came. Micah 5 verse 2 predicted the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Isaiah 7.14 predicted he would be born of a virgin and be called Emmanuel, God with us. Zechariah chapter 11 prophesied that the Messiah would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, but the money would be thrown into the house of the Lord and used by a potter. Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus, took his 30 pieces of silver and threw them in the temple where they were used to buy a potter's field to bury Judas. David predicted the Messiah would be pierced and scorned and even prophesied that his enemies would hurl insults at him, saying, He trusts the Lord. Let the Lord deliver him now. Psalm 22 predicted that Jesus' enemies would cast lots for his garments. Psalm 16 predicted that the Messiah would come back from the grave. The Old Testament contained nearly 300 prophecies about the coming of the Messiah and they were all filled in detail by Jesus Christ. Mathematician and computer expert Peter Stoner did some calculations about prophecy. And he determined by the law of compound probability, which is much more complicated than I know anything about, that the odds of just eight of the predictions about the prophesied Messiah coming true accidentally in one man were one in ten to the seventeenth power. That's 1 over 10 with 16 zeros behind it. To help you get a handle on that, that's the same odds that our government will balance the budget and get us out of debt in seven years. <laughs> but Stoner illustrates this by saying that we can take the same number of silver dollars, 10 with 16 zeros behind them, and spread them all over the state of Texas. Those silver dollars would cover the state of Texas two feet deep. Then he said, take one silver dollar and place a mark on it. Put it back in and stir the whole mass of coins across the state. Then parachute a guy in and after he lands, let him walk anywhere he wants and pick up just one coin. The odds of him picking up that one marked coin would be the same as those eight predictions about Jesus coming true in one man. But Jesus fulfilled all of those prophecies, nearly 300 of them. And do you know why? 2 Peter 1 verse 20 says, Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit, and they spoke from God. When Jesus came to this earth, he claimed that he was the Messiah, fulfilling all those earlier predictions. In the fourth chapter of Luke, we read that Jesus went into his hometown of Nazareth. He went into the synagogue as his custom was. 
they asked him to read, and they handed Jesus the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled to the 61st chapter and began to read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. All eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. Then he began to speak to them. The scriptures you just heard have been fulfilled this very day. Jesus was claiming to be the prophesied Messiah come to earth. The people of his, own, of his hometown rejected him because no prophet is accepted in his hometown. They said, isn't this Joseph's son making these claims? My sister babysat him years ago. I bought some furniture from him when he was in his early 20s. He was a fine carpenter, but no way is he the Messiah. Jesus' claim irritated the people so much that they took him to the edge of a cliff to throw him over and kill him. But Jesus, in his power as God, just walked right through the middle of them. Some people today will suggest that Jesus was a good moral teacher, a good religious leader, like Muhammad or Buddha. But Jesus claimed to be so much more than that. Listen to some of these claims that Jesus made about himself. I and the Father are one. If you have seen me, you've seen the Father. I am the truth. No one comes to the Father except through me. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He who believes in me has everlasting life. He that believes in me will live again. I will be crucified and I will come back from the dead. If anybody made those kind of claims today, we conclude that they were either a lunatic or a liar. But Jesus' disciples knew that he claimed to be the Messiah. Peter said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, that's right, Peter. And my father has revealed that to you. Thomas saw the nail prints in Jesus' hands and feet after he'd risen from the grave. And he said to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Jesus didn't say to Thomas, don't you think you're exaggerating here just a little bit? Jesus said, believe, you, you believe because you've seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Even the enemies of Jesus knew who he claimed to be. John 5.18 reads, So the Jewish leaders tried all the harder to find a way to kill him. For he not only broke the Sabbath, he called God his Father, thereby making himself equal with God. One of the best-known books for defending the faith is Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Listen to this statement that Lewis wrote. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make the choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. And then Lewis adds, you can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that option open to us. You see, Jesus claimed to be the Messiah. Come to fulfill all the Old Testament predictions. And then he conquered the grave to prove that it was true. And if we examine that historical evidence, we can only fall at his feet with Thomas and cry out, my Lord and my God. Jesus also fulfilled the Old Testament regulations. The Old Testament law was condensed into ten commandments. But really, the Old Testament law was expanded, expanded on in all of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. There were all kinds of restrictions and regulations and details about appropriate behavior. Everybody understood that obedience to the law earned God's favor. Disobedience to the law incurred God's wrath. The problem was nobody could obey every detail of the law. The Bible says for everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. And the reason that no one could keep the law is that every person since Adam has been born with a sin nature. 
Ephesians 2 verse 3 reads, All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. This doesn't mean we were born with original sin, and we're doomed if we're not baptized when we're born. But it does mean from birth, we have a predisposition to sin. And we have an inclination to sin in our nature. A baby can be born with the AIDS virus, but the baby is completely innocent. The baby has inherited that, inherited that from its parents. The Bible says in Adam, all die. We inherit from Adam one down an inclination to sin, our sin nature. Let's say you're a fifth grade school, school teacher. You have an outstanding class. One day you say to them, I have an emergency in the family. I'm going to be out for a week. I'm not going to get a substitute teacher because you're such a well-behaved class. No, what are you all laughing about? Don't you believe that? <laughs> I'm going to write each day's assignment on the board, and you come in and discipline yourselves every day. When you come back in a week, what will you find? Well, first you'll find you don't have a job. Because even though they're good kids, it's the inclination of human nature to gravitate toward evil. Man is not basically good. Man is basically evil. The liberal, liberal minds of this world don't want, us, don't want us to accept that or to believe that. Man wants to believe that he's basically good, and if he's just placed in the right environment, given the right material and a little bit of love, he'll do the right thing. But Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Some are a little better than others, but every person is evil. We all gravitate towards sin because we all have a sin nature. No one has ever kept the law. But Jesus came and he said, I came to fulfill the law. I'm going to carry it out and obey it in every detail. And the Bible says in Hebrews 4.15, This high priest of ours, Jesus Christ, understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. Remember Satan coming to Jesus after he'd not eaten in 40 days? Satan said, if you're the son of God, turn this stone into bread and eat it. That was a temptation to satisfy his appetite selfishly when he was hungry. We've all yielded to those temptations to appetite. Too much food, too much alcohol, sex outside of God's will. But when Jesus faced that temptation, he said, oh no, it's written that man doesn't live by bread alone. And he fulfilled the law. Satan then took Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple and he said, why don't you jump down and the angels will catch you? That was a temptation to get cheap, cheap attention when he was lonely. Jump off and the angels will catch you and the people will be impressed and you'll be instantly popular. We've all yielded to that temptation of ego. We've jumped off the edge for attention. But Jesus said, no, you're not to put the Lord your God to the test. Then Satan took Jesus to a high place and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Satan said, I'll give you all you see if you just bow down and worship me. That was a temptation to materialism when he had nothing. We've all yielded to those cravings for things in the wrong way. But Jesus said, no, it's written, worship the Lord your God only. And he kept the law. In Luke 4, 13, we read, when the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. In other words, Satan came back to Jesus again and again, tempting him just as he does us. But Jesus always resisted resisted the temptation. Jesus fulfilled the law. In John 8, 46, Jesus asked his enemies, which of you can truthfully accuse me of sin? Can you imagine anybody asking that question today? If I were to ask if any of you could accuse me of sin, hands will be up all over the place because you all know me. But when Jesus asked the question, no one spoke up. Peter was with Jesus for three years, and he said of Jesus, he never sinned, 
nor ever deceived anyone. John was one of Jesus' closest friends, and in 1 John 3, verse 5, we read, And you know that Jesus came to take away our sins, and there is no sin in him. Maybe even more impressive was the testimony of Jesus' enemies. When the chief priests and the Pharisees wanted to accuse him, they had to bribe false witnesses to make charges. They couldn't find any legitimate accusation. Pilate, who was the judge at Jesus' trial, said, I find no fault in this man. A man who died beside Jesus in the most horrendous of pressure said, The man has done nothing wrong. The centurion who executed Jesus said, This man is innocent. How could Jesus overcome temptation? How could he keep the law when none of the rest of us can? There's two reasons. First, Jesus was God in the flesh. He was fully man and tempted just like we are, and yet he was God in the flesh. I don't understand it. That's just the biblical truth. Second is that Jesus did not have a sin nature like we do. Jesus came into the world in an extraordinary way. He was born of a virgin, and he didn't inherit the sin nature of Adam. 1 Corinthians 15.45 calls Jesus the last Adam. You see, the, when Adam was created from the dust of the ground, he didn't have a sin nature, but he had the freedom of the will to choose. And he chose to sin, contaminating the world through that sin. But Jesus is the last Adam. He did not have a sin nature, and he obeyed the law in every detail, even though he too had freedom of the will. Then as a perfect man, the Lamb of God without spot or blemish, Jesus Christ alone was adequate to go to the cross, where the sins of all the rest of the world were laid upon him. But Jesus kept every detail of the law so that he would be an adequate sacrifice for man's sin. Remember the movie, The Last Temptation of Christ? It portrayed an imperfect Jesus. Jesus was portrayed as lusting after Mary Magdalene, and he was unsure about why he was going to the cross. The producers of the movie couldn't understand why Christians were so outraged at the idea of an imperfect Jesus. But you wouldn't expect people who don't know Jesus to understand that Jesus' perfection demonstrated his deity. Jesus had to be perfect to be a satisfactory sacrifice on the cross. If we don't have a perfect Christ, there's no, there's no sacrifice and there's no hope. But Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. He became our atoning sacrifice on Calvary. That's why 1 Corinthians 5.22 says, Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But thirdly, Jesus came to fulfill the Old Testament limitations. The Old Testament law was limited because it dealt with prevention and not cure. It dealt with the externals, but not the internals. If you have engine problems with your vehicle, a Mako paint job might make it look better, but it's not going to make the engine run any better. If you're really going to change people, there's got to be something more than the law. Jesus began to focus not on action, but on attitude. Jesus said, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never inherit the kingdom of God. There has to be a change from within, not just prevention from the outside. And to illustrate that, Jesus said, you've heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder. If you commit murder, you're subject to judgment. But I say, if you're even angry with someone, you're subject to judgment. It's not enough to restrain yourself from killing someone. The problem is hatred on the inside. Jesus said, I came to fulfill the law, so quit hating your brother. If you come to church and you know that you have something against your brother, leave your gift at the church, go find your brother, express apologies to each other, begin to forgive, settle matters quickly so that anger and hatred do not fester and you wind up killing somebody. Deal with it at the heart. Verse 27 says that you have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery, but I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Don't just deal with the action. Don't just deal with prevention. Deal with attitude. 
and a change of the heart. Be concerned about your motives. Jesus goes on to say, so if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. He doesn't mean to maim yourself, but he does say to work on your thought life. Maybe you need to cut out that streaming subscription. Maybe you need to cancel certain TV channels. Maybe there are certain eating establishments you need to avoid because it's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. You've heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. If you're sued in court and your shirt is taken from you, give your coat too. If a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. Give to those who ask and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. Roy Angel tells about the fact that the Roman government was oppressing the Jewish citizens during Jesus' time on earth. He said there was a Roman law that if a Roman soldier asked you to carry your pack for a mile, his pack for a mile, you had to do it. Many Jewish young men had marked out a mile in all directions from their home so they wouldn't carry it any more than one exact mile. He carries that pack, slams the pack down in disgust, walks home, mumbling about how unfair it is. When Israel eventually takes over Rome, he'll have that soldier carry his pack 10 miles. He gets home, goes to work in the garden, he breaks the hoe when he hits a tree with it, picks up the cat on the way to the house, throws the cat in the door, fusses at the kills, yell, kids, yells at his wife, sulks over his meal, and has a miserable evening. He's got a bad attitude. The next day he's with Jesus, and he hears Jesus talking about not just fulfilling the letter of the law, but changing your attitude. The law kills, but the Spirit gives life. Someone asks you to carry a pack one mile, you carry it two miles. A Roman soldier comes by the next day and asks him to carry his pack. He jumps up with a smile, carries the pack past the mile marker. He goes about two miles and the Roman soldier wants to give him a tip, but he refuses it. The soldier says, if you need a good word with our government, I'm your man. The man whistles all the way home, does a couple hours work in the garden, carries the cat in the house, Plays with the kids, kisses his wife. They have a great meal and a great evening together. He's begun to change his attitude, not just follow the letter of the law. See the difference? The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. It's not just action, doing as little as we can to just get by. It's changing the attitude. Jesus came to fulfill the limitations of the law. He came to transform us from within. If there's something we ought to be grateful for as Christians this Thanksgiving season, we ought to be grateful that there's a big difference between religion and Christianity. Religion is based on philosophy. Christianity is based on history. Jesus Christ literally came to this earth fulfilling all those Old Testament prophecies. And the predictions. He died on a real cross. He literally and bodily arose from the grave. Our faith is based on historical fact. Religion is a system of morals. Christianity is the worship of a person. Religion said if you keep these rules, maybe you'll earn God's favor. But Christianity says you can't keep the rules. You've already blown it. But Jesus Christ kept the rules for you. He becomes your substitute. Just put your trust in him and worship him and he'll save you. Romans 3 verse 20 says, For no one can be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ and this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who you are. It's like we stand before God, but we've got Jesus Christ's report card in our hand. Religion is a system of morals that we cannot keep. But Christianity is the worship of a person who kept the law for us. Religion is rules. Christianity is a relationship. 
A well-known Christian author tells about a time when he strayed away from the Lord. He began to have an extramarital friendship. They made plans to make it an extramarital affair. He checked into a hotel under an assumed name, picked up the phone to call the woman and make arrangements for their rendezvous. As he picked up the phone, he heard a still, quiet voice, as though it were the voice of God, saying, Keith, I love you. He put the phone down. His hand was trembling. His heart was racing. He picked up the phone again. And it was again as if he heard the voice of God saying, Keith, even if you have the affair, I'll still love you. He put the phone down again, decided not to call. He went back to his marriage, restored his relationship at home, and restored his relationship with God. What kept him pure was not fear that he was not keeping the law, but it was love. It was the development of a relationship. He didn't want to offend the one who loved him unconditionally. Like Joseph in Egypt, when he was tempted by Potiphar's wife, he said, I can't do this thing and sin against my God. Religion is rules. Christianity is a relationship that we're developing with Jesus Christ. Religion is bondage. Christianity is freedom. Religion is motivated by fear. Christianity is motivated by love. Love is the reason Jesus went to the cross. God loves us so much that he sent his one and only son to fulfill the law and pay a debt that we could never pay. God's offer of salvation through Jesus Christ is available to you this morning. If you've never accepted that gift, today would be a great day to confess your sin, repent of that sin, and make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. There's no other name given among men by which you must be saved. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful that Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law. A law that we could never keep, but it sure tells us what we've done wrong. And we're so thankful that Jesus Christ came and paid that sin debt for us. That we too have that hope of salvation, that hope of forgiveness of our sins, and that hope of eternity with you. And Lord, not just for ourselves, but everyone we come in contact with, they too need to know the good news of salvation through your Son. And Lord, it's my prayer today that someone here this morning will take that step of faith, confess their sins, repent of their sins, make you Lord of their life, to make that next step into the waters of baptism, being submissive to your, to your call, and live an obedient life of faithfulness to you and your Son. Lord, we love you this morning and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.
you. Uh, just a reminder, today is youth group uh, for parents, so if you're leaving your children here, it's from 11.30 to 1.30. Uh, no need to go anywhere now. But uh, I have a sign-in, sign-out sheet, so the easiest thing for everybody to do is if you have kids that are staying for youth group, as soon as we service is over, come up front because everybody else is going to go back there. So come up front and we can get them signed in right here. Just put your contact and your phone number down there in case, God forbid, there's an emergency or they just need their mom real bad or dad. Um, also, when it's time to come back and pick them up, if you could just, if you could please come inside and uh, come see me or, or Lauren, that would be great. Instead of maybe just texting them and say, hey, I'm here, and then I look out and see a kid running out the door. Uh, also, lots of things coming up in December. Be on the lookout. Get on the uh, FCC Youth Facebook page. Uh, if, you, if you don't want to find that, then here's, a, here's another thing we can do. If you look on your bulletin, you'll see a QR code right there. You just open the camera app on your phone, hold it over the QR code, hit the link that comes up. There will be a Google form that you can put some contact information in, comment, just tell us a couple things about you. That's about it. And I will personally send you the link for the FCC family page, if your youth page, if you would like. Uh, December events, we have youth group coming up on the 4th. Uh, on the 11th, we have Clearbrook Winter Wonderland. There's going to be a little more information on that to come. Still working out the details. Uh, the 16th is a big date. From 6 to 8 p.m., we're going to have the youth Christmas party. It's going to be an escape room, games, crafts, dinner will be provided, all that good stuff. And uh, that's enough for now. I've taken enough of my time. So thank you, guys. Have a great day. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, the only thing I have several announcements on the on the screen. I just want a reminder of the Christmas concert next Sunday evening, six o'clock. Promised Land Quartet, Ivan Parker. There's some flyers still out on the table if you want to hang those up in the local stores, things like that. Uh, no tickets, free will offering. I uh, hope to see a packed house. It'll be a great night. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for your presence here this morning. We're thankful for who you are and what you do for each one of us in our lives. Lord, continue to give us boldness and grace as we talk to those around us that you've placed in our path to share the good news of salvation with them through your son, Jesus. Lord, there's no other name that they can be saved. Lord, continue to, to guide us and direct us. Give us safety in our travels home and bring us here safely again next week. In Jesus' name, amen.